turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 20 uh, this morning. There's a, a preacher who went to a farmer and he asked him if he, if, if you had a thousand dollars, would you give 500 of it to the Lord? The farmer said, I would. And he said, if you had two cows, would you give one of them to the Lord? He said, sure. He said, if you had two pigs, would you give one of them to the Lord? The farmer said, now that's not fair. You know that I have two pigs. <laughs> so, hypothetically, <laughs> it's all good. I'll give whatever you want me to give. But we actually started talking about moving uh, out. That's another story. Perhaps somebody should have told this farmer that uh, it's been said the happiest people on earth are the people who have discovered the joy of giving. Our text this morning deals with the idea of giving. It's uh, Philippians is the, the book of joy, so I guess you might say it's also talking about the joy of giving. Uh, Paul writes this letter to thank the, the church for their gift, for their gift of encouragement to him while he was sitting in prison in Rome. And here in the closing verses, uh, he's actually at the, the thank you part of the letter. Uh, he's, he's very much thankful for their loving concern that he is, that the church has shown him. And back in verse 10, he started... Uh, the thanks, and then last week we looked at uh, verses 11 through 13, uh, where Paul teaches on contentment. Uh, he, he, he says, thank you for the gift, but uh, I, I'm really, uh, I'm content. Uh, and there's a few reasons why we mentioned that he might do this. Uh, one, we said that he wants to reassure them that even though it had been 10 years since they, he had heard from the Philippians, he wanted them to know that uh, he understood that they couldn't support him, and he wanted to make sure that they knew he was okay, that he was content either way. He also uses the opportunity to teach about contentment. And also, uh, a third possibility that we didn't mention last week is that in Paul's day, there were preachers uh, circulating around who were up for the money. Uh, there were charlatans and, and hucksters who would uh, go house to house uh, preying on the, the naive in order to get money. Uh, and so Paul wants to make very uh, clear that he's not one of these people, uh, that he's not trying to ask anyone or beg for money. Uh, there are people out there today. Uh, you turn on a lot of the religious channels. Uh, you have uh, satellite or cable. They used to be way up there. Uh, but TBN, I know, I'm not saying all of them on these channels are up for money, but there are plenty of them out there uh, who, are, who are only in it for the money. And so Paul says, I'm not one of these people. I'm not one of these men. So I want you to know that whether you sent me this gift or not, I was going to be okay because I have Jesus Christ. Uh, I've learned how to be content no matter what because Christ and his grace, they're enough for me. Uh, and I have the power through him to be content uh, no matter what. I can embrace what God's doing in my life and I can trust that he's good to me in all situations because I have Jesus Christ. So in our last text, we really saw the theology of uh, Christian contentment. Uh, in our verses today, we kind of see the, the theology of Christian giving. And so let's look at verses uh, 14 through 20 of Philippians chapter 4. He says, notwithstanding, going back to his original thought in, in verse 10, you have, well, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all, and abound, I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the time we can spend together. We thank you for the privilege we have of opening up your word this morning. We thank you for your spirit uh, that you give us uh, in order to uh, live uh, what your word uh, calls us to live. And so we pray that as we look into this text, we pray as we look into uh, the theology of giving, that, that you might impress upon our hearts uh, what we need to be doing how we need to be given, and we pray that you might uh, work uh, through this passage, work in our hearts and our lives, that we might be changed. Uh, we ask that you would receive all the glory and honor for all of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, 
here we have this theology uh, of giving. And the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, giving is prompted by love. So giving is prompted by love. And in this, this, this thank you letter, that's where Paul begins. Uh, and he says in, in verses 14 through 16, notwithstanding, you've well done. You didn't communicate with my affliction. Uh, Philippians, you've been with me since the beginning of the gospel. And when I departed from Macedonia, uh, no other church helped me. No other church supported me. No other church cared for me the way you cared for me. Now, for us as believers, uh, everything that we do should be motivated by love. 1 Corinthians 13 makes it very clear that we can do a lot of good things, but if we don't have love behind it, then it's nothing. Right? So, so like everything, our giving should be motivated by love. First by a love for God, uh, and then by a love for others. And we love God because he first loved us. And so behind our giving should first of all be a love for God, and then a love for others. And that's what we see here with these Philippians. They love Paul. They cared about Paul. They were concerned about him. And back in, in verse 10, that's what he says. And that's what he's more thankful for, it is the love that they have rather than the gift that they send. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care of me has flourished again. And we said last week that that word flourished is revived again. It was used of um, blossoms blossoming in the spring, flowers blossoming in the spring. And so he's saying, your love has blossomed again for me. You, you showed care for me when you gave this gift to me. He's like, I understand that, that you couldn't do this until now, but I, I know that your care never wavered. Your love for me never wavered. And so they gave to him so that, they could, so that Paul could see how much they loved him. Uh, and that's what giving is. It's a tangible way to show that we care, to show that we're concerned for someone else. That's why we give gifts at, at Christmas or birthdays because we love the person, I think. I mean, I don't think it's uh, the birthday's coming up, i, I got to give him a present. Maybe that is. That's not what it's supposed to be. Our Christmas is coming. I have to give uh, this gift. Giving should be prompted by love. Uh, the same thing is true with giving in the church. It should be prompted by love. A love for God and a love for uh, people. A love for God's purposes. And that was the heart behind the Philippians here. Uh, they were moved to give because they had a concern for Paul in his ministry. And that's what we saw back in verse 10. Their, their concern, their care, and it flourished again. So it wasn't uh, that they needed to give out of legalism. It wasn't because they felt like, I have to do this or else I'm going to be judged. God's going to strike me dead if I don't give to Paul in his ministry. It wasn't done mindlessly to check it off their marks of a good Christian to-do list. They gave because they cared. They gave because they loved. Uh, and and that should be the motivation behind all of our giving. It, it should be out of a love and care uh, for somebody else, for someone else. Uh, and so back in, in verse uh, uh, 14, he continues the thought. Like I said, he kind of takes a parenthesis there in 11, 12, and 13. That's where he says, notwithstanding, going back to what I was saying, uh, you have well done. You've done well that you did communicate with my affliction. And, and that word you've done well means you have acted honorably, you have acted nobly or beautifully. You've done a beautiful thing here by sending me this gift. And again, for Paul, it was more than thanks for the cash, it was thanks for the care. Thanks for caring uh, about me. And, and when you did this, when you sent this offering to me, it was a beautiful thing. It was a wonderful thing. Uh, and that word communicated there doesn't mean that they spoke to him. It means that they shared with him. They shared with him in his affliction, he says in verse 14. He says, notwithstanding, you've well done. You've done a wonderful thing that you did share with me in my affliction. That's how much they, they loved this man. That's how much they cared for Paul. And so they, they gave to him because they loved him. And they shared with him. Caring means sharing, right? Is that what he's saying? Uh, and that's what uh, Paul is saying here. You've taken this burden on yourself. You're taking it with you. And now how did they do this? They weren't sitting next to him in prison. Um, well, Epaphroditus may have been at this time, but they were sharing his troubles. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 25 and 26, it kind of gives us the answer. It says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or one member honored, uh, all the members rejoice with it. So that's how they took on this burden with him. That's how they shared with him, because they loved him. 
Uh, and so just like we uh, share burdens with one another when somebody has a need, uh, we take that on uh, as our own. Uh, we care. We, we suffer with them. Uh, and that's what the Philippians were doing with Paul. They were united in heart and mind and purpose uh, in love. Uh, when Paul left the church at Philippi after he planted it, he took their heart with him. He was their first pastor, uh, and they loved him. And then he, of course, was beaten and thrown out of the city, and he became their first missionary. Uh, and so they sent their heart and love along with their support when he left. Uh, that's why Paul was willing to accept their gifts, because he knew that they loved him. Uh, that's why one reason why he didn't accept the money from the Corinthian church. He knew, uh, he knew they didn't have the same care, they didn't have the same love that uh, the Philippians had. Paul shared, or the Philippians shared the same love, the same care. Uh, when Paul suffered, they suffered. When Paul was honored, they were rejoicing. Uh, that's the way it is uh, with the church, with the church family. Uh, we take the burdens of one another, and that's what happened here. And so they gave because they loved Paul, and they were willing to share that burden with him. They put themselves in prison with him. They felt what he felt. Uh, he's locked away from the churches. He, uh, he can't be with those people that he loved. He can't minister to the churches like he wants to. He's probably facing his, his own execution, he's thinking at this time. He's being ridiculed and derided by uh, other preachers out there, uh, feeling abandoned. And, and so the Philippians kind of come alongside and they take on that burden themselves uh, because they partnered with him. They partnered with him and shared with him in his trials and afflictions. And so they gave, and they gave from the heart. It wasn't like, oh, I think Paul's in trouble, I guess. Uh, let's just write him a check and uh, be done with it. It was, no, we love this man. We care about this man. How can we help him? What can we do? Let's scrounge up some money. Let's, let's see if we can help him out. Because remember, they're not exactly wealthy. Uh, they're not rolling in the dough, so to speak. So to speak. Uh, they were poor. Uh, and so they give because they care. They cared about what Paul was doing. They cared about uh, Paul's life. They had been impacted by Paul. Paul uh, had been used by God to bless their life, and so they wanted to return the favor. And they wanted to be used by God to bless his life. And that's why we give. That's one reason why we give. We want to be, be blessed by God. We've been blessed by God, and so we want to return the favor to somebody else. Uh, and, and so Paul uh, illustrates their loving concern in verses 15 through 16. He says, Philippians, you know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. No church gave to me, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you said once and again unto my necessity. He says, there is no other church that was willing to partner with me. No other church came uh, alongside of me to help me. No other church cared like you cared. Not only did they send him off with generosity uh, and support, they continued to support him and care for him. Even while he was in Thessalonica, which wasn't that far from Philippi. Uh, and it was immediately after, so they were ready and eager to support this man because of what he was doing. Now, they couldn't go. They couldn't go into the uttermost parts of the world, but they could give. They could partner with him, and that's what they did. And that becomes the model for our local church uh, giving to missions, because not everybody can go. And not everybody is supposed to go uh, to the uttermost parts of the world. But God designed it this way, that through the local church, people would be sent out and people would be supported. Because if we all took out, and took off and scattered, never gathered, then that would be uh, an issue. And so um, there's a partnership when we give, when we give commissions. And there's a partnership here as well, and Paul says it. He's like, you partnered with me in the gospel uh, by giving. You came alongside. You're part of this. Uh, and they did it because they cared. They cared about Paul. They cared about God. They cared about the people of the world that Paul would be ministering to. Because they had been dramatically changed by the faithful preaching of God's word. The, the, the faithful preaching of the gospel changed their eternities, changed their lives, and, and so they want this work to continue. Uh, they're saying, you know, Paul, yeah, go out. You, your ministry changed us, now go change others. Uh, and so that's why they give, because they care. And that's why we give. We give to the ministry of the local church. And missions, because ultimately it should be because we love God and we love others. We give so that God's uh, work can be accomplished in the lives of others and in our own lives as well.
So we give to the church so that we can gather and so that we can grow uh, in God's word, knowing God's word and living God's word and teaching God's word. And, and then so that we can go out and preach God's word and share God's word and the gospel with the unsaved around us. When you give, you're making it possible for us to meet together. You're making it possible for us to have the ministries that we have. When you give, you're making it possible for this word to be taught, for, for us to be edified, for us to go out and evangelize the lost. And so when we give, we're helping God accomplish his purposes in the world. And so when we give to missions, when we give to faith promise, you're accomplishing the same thing. Uh, and, and so the question is, do we care? Are we concerned about God's purposes? Are we concerned about God's people? Are we concerned uh, about the loss of the world? In the United States, in, in New England, in Maine, in Wilmington, in everywhere. If we're concerned, then we must be faithful in our giving, because our giving is prompted by love. Next, God says, not only is our, our, our giving prompted by love, but our giving is actually profitable. Uh, our giving is, is profitable. That's what he says here in verse 17, he says, not because I, I desire a gift, but it is, I desire fruit that they abound to your account. And if you know anything about Paul, we mentioned before, he wasn't in the ministry for the money. We know that. He's not trying to get rich, uh, but there are plenty out there who were. Plenty of, of charlatans, like I said, who were trying to get rich. And I said that there are many out there in our day today who are, who are trying to do the same thing. Uh, you know, selling uh, crazy things on some of those religious channels like uh, prayer mats <coughs> with in unicorn tears or, or, or something something uh, way out there and I don't know if that's one but stuff like that uh, so that they can live in their cozy mansions and fly around in their private jets uh, and then they attach the name of Christ to it which is an abomination and so Paul again is saying I'm writing to you not because I desire the gift I, I'm not after the money he wants to make it clear that he's not after the money he says in reality I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Uh, I desire that you would give because I want you to receive profit. I want you to receive benefit for what you have given. Now, Paul had a real need. Uh, there's no denying that. He, was, uh, he had a legitimate need here. Uh, he's in prison, and, and he needed a need, and it's met. And we see that in verse 18. But Paul wants to make sure there's no confusion. He, he's saying, I'm not after your money. I want you to reap eternal rewards. I want you to receive benefits forever for your, because you gave. And Jesus says in Acts 20, 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so he says, I'm thankful that you gave to this ministry because your giving is fruitful. Your giving produces a spiritual profit in your account. And that word that he uses there, abound, uh, is a, a financial term that spoke of compounding interest. So he's saying that uh, your giving is just going to continue to benefit you. Not that we should give selfishly, but there's a benefit there. So while we often think that our giving only benefits the recipient of our gift, God assures us in this text that our giving actually benefits us as well. Uh, and Paul's actually making a, a case here that, that their giving benefits them more than it benefits him. You think about that for a minute. When we give, we're actually getting more than we're giving away. And that's what God is saying through Paul. Now, how does that work? Uh, how, do, how, can, how, how is it that uh, I'm giving away my money? How am I actually gaining more in return? Well, that's what Paul says here. Right? He says, uh, I don't desire the gift. What I desire because of your giving is that the fruit will abound to your account, to your credit. So you'll be credited with greater things that you will grow in godliness. Right? Giving helps us grow in godliness, which is better than gain. Right? It's greater contentment with God, godliness is great gain. And so our, uh, our growth as believers is worth more than anything that money can buy. So that's one way. Uh, giving is part of our maturing as Christians. The closer we are to God, the more we desire to give. And the more we uh, desire to give, the closer we become to God. It's a, it's a circle. Uh, and so giving, one writer says, isn't God's way of raising money. It's one of his ways of raising his children. Uh, giving is one way that God helps us mature in him. Giving helps our faith. It helps our trust. It, it causes us to lean on our God. It, it brings us closer to him. 
And so it's profitable because it produces Christian character in our lives. It produces spiritual fruit in our lives. That will then lead to eternal rewards in glory. That is what we have to look forward to in our I guess, spiritual bank account here. Uh, because our, our giving, he says, pays dividends. Uh, again, he's not saying that if you give, you're going to become rich materially. Uh, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying you know, give it all away and then uh, you're going to be wealthy, uh, healthy, and wise. Okay, he's saying if you give, you will gain spiritual riches that are well beyond anything that you could see here in this world. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, when he says, lay, up, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and, duff and rust, rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so the teaching is, is similar. It's saying you're producing a, uh, a spiritual reward. You are, you are getting treasures in heaven when we invest in eternal matters. Rather than trying to hoard stuff for here and now. Uh, hoarding stuff that we can't take with us is not the wisest use of our money, Jesus says, and, and Paul is kind of alluding to that here. Uh, the best use of our money is giving to God's purposes because that makes a difference forever. How? Giving allows the gospel to spread throughout the world, uh, which then leads to the salvation of sinners. Uh, giving allows the word of God to be preached so that people will grow in Christ and that people will go with the gospel of Christ so that souls will be saved. Giving is profitable. Most of you are familiar with uh, George Mueller, and most of us are familiar with the tremendous faith he had uh, and trust that he had in God to provide for his needs uh, as he founded an orphanage. What many of us may not know is that he also faithfully supported a young missionary to China named Hudson Taylor. Uh, Mueller had become burdened for China uh, and faithfully prayed for Hudson Taylor over and over and, he, uh, and would write to him. And he started out by supporting him at what would today be $1,000 uh, a year um, that he would give. And, and that amount increased over the years until at the end he was spending nearly $75,000 a year to support Hudson Taylor in today's world. Did George Mueller give up anything? Did he give away anything? Yeah, that's a lot of money. You're sure you could give away stuff. Yeah, but no, he, he made an eternal investment. Hudson Taylor spent 51 years in China as a missionary. He founded China Inland Mission, which was responsible for bringing 800 missionaries into the country, who then they started 125 schools, and they direct, it was all directly resulted in 18,000 souls saved. This is an eternal investment. Hudson Taylor has also inspired countless uh, Christians to follow in his example. Uh, Amy Carmichael, uh, Eric Fidel, June Elliott, and countless others have gone to the mission field because of Hudson Taylor. And they have impacted countless lives. And his influence is still being felt today. And George Mueller played a part in this because he helped support Hudson Taylor. And so that's what Paul is saying here. Your giving is producing eternal benefit. It is paying huge dividends for eternity. And so don't ever think that when we give something up, money or material things for the cause of Christ, that we're actually giving up anything. We're making an eternal investment every time we support uh, something that God is doing. And that's the idea that Paul is saying here. When we give to the work of the ministry, whether it's giving to this church or, or giving to missions, we're not giving up anything. What we're doing is storing treasures in heaven. We're investing in eternal stock that will pay dividends forever, in lives being changed forever. We can't take our money with us, but by investing in God's work, we will forever be able to see the impact that our giving has. And that's what Paul is saying. Because we have the opportunity to impact lives for eternity. We may never know this side of, of glory the impact that our giving has on people. I'm reminded of the song Thank You a little bit, the great old song. Um, because you gave. Uh, and, and that's what heaven will be like. There will be people in there who are impacted because you gave. You may never know today. Uh, we know, we see results of, uh, uh, 
of missions when the missionaries when they come here and they show the, the presentations of, of souls being saved. Well, because you gave, those souls were able to be reached. So our giving makes a difference. Our giving is incredibly profitable. And that's what Paul says here. And so uh, the Philippians, they understood this and, and they gave faithfully to invest in Paul and his ministry. And we're going to do the same. We're going to invest in, in those servants and those ministries that are faithfully proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we give to these works, we're wisely investing uh, the resources that God has given us. And we're making an eternal impact. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, uh, 17 through 19, we don't have time to go there today, but it speaks of that truth. And Paul says, I want you to reap a spiritual harvest here uh, because of your giving. Uh, I desire not the gift, but I desire that you would reap eternal benefits for your giving. And that's what he says in verse 17. And so giving is profitable. Giving is prompted by love. Giving is profitable. And giving is pleasing to God. In verse 18. He says, but I have all. I don't, I don't need this gift. I have all. And I am bound. I'm, I'm full. And, and the reason why I'm full and overflowing is because I have received this gift that you've given me. Uh, of Epaphroditus who came to minister. Uh, the things which were sent from you and to bring the, the offering. But, but the thing here is, not only is this gift pleasing to me, and it meets my needs, but even more importantly, this gift is pleasing to God. Your giving is pleasing to God, he says. And he says it's an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But again, I, I have it all. And when you sent Epaphroditus, this was a wonderful thing that you did for me, that you gave to me. I'm well taken care of. I am pleased, but, but more importantly, your giving it pleases God. And that's really the bottom line. It's a sweet smell to God. It's acceptable to Him. Uh, I enjoy the smell of coffee. I know they're probably not alone. Um, Alex, Alex does, too. Anytime I'm making my coffee, he's like, smell it? And so I have to bring it over so he can smell the coffee. I like meat cooked on the grill. I'm going to make you hungry now. Um, sorry. Uh, the, the smell of uh, fresh cut grass, the name of you. Those things are, are well pleasing. Uh, what do you do? I'm not asking for answers, but, but it's a weird question. But those things that are pleasing to you, our giving is like that to God. It's pleasing to Him. And Paul is using Old Testament language here when the priest would offer a sacrifice on the altar and uh, pour incense that would uh, go up uh, to the heavens. The sweet smell would picture the pleasure that God had in that sacrifice that was brought to God. And, and the idea here is when we give, it's a sweet smell to God. God is pleased by the fact that we are willing to give. We want to please God. Does anybody in here want to please God? I hope so. Now, how can we make sure our giving is pleasing to God? These believers, they had a, they had a, a willing heart and over, it's overflowing with love and concern as we looked at and gratitude, and that's the kind of giving that pleases God. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, your mind is probably already there. Uh, it says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. God is pleased with a, a cheerful giver. The Bible says to give cheerful. It's cheerful giving that's pleasing to God. I think most of us are in agreement here that we prefer when somebody gives us uh, a gift cheerfully rather than grudgingly, like uh, I'm giving this to you, but I don't really want you to have it. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those situations where, okay, you can have it, and you're just kind of like, you know, just keep it, right? And, and that's almost the image that I get here. God loves a cheerful giver. We do too. We do too. I, I don't want to put you out, right? I don't want to. I, I don't want to take this gift from you if you really don't want me to have it. Uh, and so. God doesn't say loves a reluctant giver or a guilt-ridden giver. God is pleased when we do it willingly, when we give joyfully, when we give eagerly to his work to accomplish his purposes. It's a cheerful giver that is pleasing to our Lord. So how can we make sure that we're giving cheerfully? Well, I think we remember what God has given to us. I think when we remember what God has given to us, then how can we not give cheerfully, right? In 2 Corinthians 8 9, it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. And so we give cheerfully. 
in a way that pleases God, not to earn points with God, not to earn salvation, not to buy forgiveness from God. I can't write a check to God uh, to be forgiven, to be saved. We give cheerfully in a way that pleases God because he graciously gave to us. That's why we give. Because we as people have rebelled against God. We rebel against his authority, his rightful rule in our lives. And so because of that, we're all guilty before God for some very serious crimes. And so we deserve serious punishment and everlasting eternal punishment. But God, in his infinite grace, mercy, and love, uh, gave us Jesus Christ. And Christ willingly takes on perfect humanity, lives the life that we could never live, lives perfectly without sin, dies the death that we deserve to die. He came and humbly laid uh, down his life to go to the cross to take the judgment for our sin, the judgment that we deserve. That if we would believe in him, if we would trust in him, we could be made rich, that we could be forgiven, that we could be uh, saved from our sins and have everlasting life. And so that is how we give cheerfully. We remember what God gave to us, and then it's, okay, yeah, I'll give you anything. It's the same thing in Romans 12. When we think of the mercies of God, that we offer our lives as a living sacrifice. Uh, part of our living is our giving. Uh, and it's not just an abstract thought. It's we offer everything to God as a living sacrifice because he has given everything to us. That's the idea. And so we give cheerfully because of God's grace in our lives. Because we are grateful and we are thankful for what God has done for us. And so as we worship by our giving, we please God. As we do this cheerfully, when we cheerfully put money in the offering place, it's worship that's pleasing to God. When we give to faith promise, that is worship that's pleasing to God when we do it cheerfully. When we give to a family in need, when we give to the deacon's fund, when we give to help somebody go to, to camp, or, or we pay to help somebody study for the ministry, when we open up our homes to missionaries, uh, when, when we have a missionaries over for a meal, we're giving. We're worshiping God because we're giving. That's worship. Worship isn't just something we do here. It's when we give, we are worshiping. When we give cheerfully, we are worshiping, and God is pleased with that. When you lend out your car, you give away your car, uh, to help somebody else out, that's an act of worship, and it's pleasing to God. The money that, from an earthly perspective here, had been given to Paul to meet his needs for the sake of the preaching of the gospel, were seen by God as an act of worship that was pleasing to him. And the same thing is true with our giving. It may go into seemingly mundane things like paying the light bill, paying for the, the heat, uh, or, or, or something else, to keep this church running. But from God's perspective, as we give cheerfully for the work of the ministry to continue, we are worshiping. And that worship, it says, is an odor of a sweet smell. It's a sacrifice that's acceptable and well-pleasing to God. And, and so he says, we can give, or we should give, because it pleases God. We should give with gratitude. And, and I know sometimes that can be difficult. Maybe sometimes we think, oh, I could give cheerfully if I had a ton of money. If I didn't have only two pigs, I could give one of my pigs up cheerfully, like the farmer in the illustration. <laughs> if I had a uh, million dollars, if I had won the mega millions, sure. Uh, I had $1.6 billion. I would not want that. Um, uh, and all the headaches and everything else that comes with it, I don't think so. Um, but if I had that, then I could give cheerfully. I could give with gratitude. Well, our passage says, you can give it anyway, and you will be okay, no matter how much you have. He says in verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so giving, we give because giving brings a promise. There's a promise here. Not only would uh, the Philippians receive spiritual blessings and eternal dividends for their giving, but God also says, I will the God, my God will supply your physical needs. My God, he says, will take care of your needs the same way that you took care of mine. That's a promise. And I love how personal he is here. He says, my God. Not, not just any God. Not any false God. But my God is big enough. My God is big enough to take care of you. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My God has provided your greatest need. And so my God can meet any lesser needs that you have as well. All according to his riches. 
which his riches are vast, his riches are limitless, and he will take care of you, he says. Now keep in mind, the, meaning, the, the immediate context here uh, has to do with God meeting the needs of the Philippians as they met Paul's needs. Right? They're giving, uh, maybe sacrificially, to help this man out. And so Paul is assuring them that, I know this is a sacrifice to you, but don't worry. Because God will take care of you. God took care of me, he says, basically. He said, through your gift, the, the, God has taken care of me. And so God will do the same thing for you. Now, this isn't saying that God will give us a blank check for whatever we want, or whatever we think we need. We know this. God's promise doesn't uh, give, God's promise here to give doesn't uh, mean that we can expect, to grab, expect God to provide for us when most of our spending is self-centered. If most of my money is going to pay for luxuries and pleasure, I can't complain that God isn't take, taking care of me when I can't afford to put food on the table. Right? If I have a, a smartphone and a, and a TV with 900 channels on my 84-inch TV, but I can't afford to heat my house, is, is God... Not upholding his word here? No. The bottom line is we will have everything that God wants us to have. Everything God knows that we need. And that's the rub, right? Uh, but I need a, a new car. Brand new. Uh, I need a, a new Mustang. Or uh, I need a, a new smartphone. I mean, mine can only do so much. Uh, pretty much everything I don't need it to do, it can still do. But I need a new one. And I can't afford it, God, so help me out. That's not what he's saying. God will give us what we truly need as long as we are giving our talents, our time, and our treasure to him and to help others in need. And so God provides for us when we are faithfully living for him. So ultimately, faithful, godly living can produce faithful, godly giving because God will provide. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Verses 24 through 34. It's a well-known passage. I'm not going to read the whole thing because we're running out of time here. But Jesus says that God will meet your needs. He says he uses the birds, the lilies, the grass as an illustration uh, to say God takes care of them. And if he's willing to take care of them, he will certainly take care of you. He cares for you far more than he cares for the birds uh, and, and the grass and the lilies. You know how we know that? Because he sent Jesus for us. He cares more for you. And so if he takes care of them, he will take care of you. And then he qualifies it in verse 33. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. And so he says, concern yourself not with wealth, not with money. Concern yourself with the pursuit of righteousness and holiness. Concern yourself for living, with living for God's glory living for his purposes, and then God will take care of you. And so when we pursue Jesus Christ with our entire lives, God will make sure that we have what we need, that we are not lacking. And Paul was living proof of this. And we've said it, and you've heard it, and it's worth repeating, that God supplies our needs and not our greeds. And God will supply in a variety of ways. And tonight, I invite you to come back. And what I want to do tonight is is share stories of how God has provided for you over the years. I want us to have a, a testimony time uh, of God's gracious provision. If you don't like standing up and sharing, you can write it down and I will read it. But I, I want us to kind of just do that tonight before we go to prayer to look at how God has provided uh, for each and every one of us and then that we might praise him for his gracious provision in our lives. Um, but God will take care of us as we pursue his righteousness. As we pursue God the living, uh, Charles Spurgeon was trying to raise money for some poor, some poor children in London, and so he goes to Bristol, hoping to raise this money, raising uh, 300 pounds uh, for the London's London's homeless children. At the end of the week of uh, meetings, uh, lives had been changed, and he reached his financial goal. Well, that night uh, he, he's having a prayer time, and he felt compelled to give away the money to another servant named George Mueller. Spurgeon thought the idea, thinking, well, I need this money for my own work. Yet he couldn't shake the, the, the thought that God wanted him to give it away. And so finally he decided, well, I better give it away. And so the next morning he, went, he, he goes to uh, Mueller's orphanage and he, found, he finds George Mueller on his knees praying, of course, right? 
Uh, and so uh, Spurgeon places his hand on Mueller's shoulder and he says, Georgia, I think God wants you to have this. And he hands him the 300 pounds that he raised. Mueller gets up thrilled and he says, I, I was just asking God for this exact amount. And then the two servants of, of God wept and rejoiced at, at God's provision. And then when Spurgeon goes back to London, he finds an envelope on his desk containing more than 300 pounds. The Lord returns the 300 pounds and with 300 shillings of interest. That doesn't mean a lot for me, but it's more than the 300 pounds. God had taken care of both men's needs as they were faithfully living for Christ. It may not happen this way for you. It may not happen this quickly. But the text promises that God will supply the needs of those who live and give faithfully. One way or another, God will do it. Uh, and, and again, this is not what we think we need. It's what God knows we need. There's a difference. Paul has already said in our text that he experienced poverty. He experienced hunger serving the Lord. So we understand that in those moments, though he may have felt like he needed money, he didn't. <coughs> he may have felt like he needed food. God determined he didn't need those things. What he needed was to see that Christ was sufficient. So don't misunderstand the promise here. God doesn't say that if you give faithfully and live faithfully, you won't ever have hard times. You won't ever struggle. You won't ever wonder how you're going to keep the lights on. You won't ever wonder where the next meal is coming from. He says he will supply those needs. And whatever those real needs are, God knows them. We don't always know. So maybe, maybe you have to go through a season of want, of lack, because you need to see that Christ is what you really need. That his grace is sufficient. That's what Paul learned. Maybe you have to wait for the money to come in so that you can learn to trust in God. Paul learned all of it. And he learned through it all that Jesus Christ was enough. And he could trust his Lord to meet those needs. And God wants us to make sure that we're trusting in him with everything. He wants to make sure that we're believing in him. We trust him to take care of our eternal soul. We can trust him to take care of our lives on this earth as well. I read a story of a, a young couple who served in youth ministry uh, before they went off to seminary. They were struggling financially. One particular night, they were only had 13 cents in their bank account. Uh, not a lot. Uh, and they were going to get paid the next day, but they were out of some supplies, some important supplies, like toilet paper. Uh, I'm guessing they didn't use credit cards, and so they didn't go out and buy any. So they're getting frustrated, as anybody would, without toilet paper, and they were worried about their situation, and so when they decided, okay, we need to pray. We need to ask God to provide for us. And so they did that. Later that night, uh, their youth group decided to play a prank on them. No idea. Uh, and, and toilet paper in their house and their yard. Evidently, this group was filled with good kids, and they didn't really do it right. And so they only used one roll uh, put over the house, and they left with the rest of the, the package on the doorstep. Uh, and so when the young couple opened the door, they saw that their prayers had been answered. God will provide, even in ways like that. Uh, and the context here is clearly talking about material needs, but before I move on, I want us to, to make, and I think we know this, but I want to make it clear that God meets all of our needs. This includes our spiritual needs, our emotional needs, and our material needs. Whatever you truly need, God has promised to supply it. If you need forgiveness, God will grant it in Jesus Christ. If you need grace, God's grace is sufficient. You need hope. God is the God of hope. Are you tired? Are you feeling like you need to give up? Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So God will not just provide your material needs, but he will provide for all of your needs. And it's in Jesus Christ that we have all of these met, all these needs met. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, uh, and in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so in Christ we have everything we need. And he will provide for our physical needs as well. Hudson Taylor, again, there was a, an occasion when the China Inland Mission was struggling, and they only had 25 cents in their account. And he wrote to one of his mission, ministry associates, and, and he says, we have 25 cents to our account. He says, think of it. 25 cents plus all the promises of and so no matter what we don't have, we have all the promises of God. We have the Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ, who meets our needs and who is enough and who is sufficient. And so here, Paul says, you gave and, and you can continue to give because God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then he bursts into this doxology here at the end when he says, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, and that's the only response. That's a proper response to, to being able to give, being able to be used of God to give, and God's gracious provision enabling us to give is a response of praise and honor. If you ever wondered why we sing, sing the doxology after we uh, take the offering, uh, that's why we do it. It's a proper response to being able to give back what God has given to us. So we, we take the offering as an act of worship. We worship God by giving. And we're, we're thankful to do it, I hope, cheerfully doing it because it's, a, it's worship and it's pleasing to God. And then after we, we sing to him and, and we say, thank you, Lord, for giving to us. We praise you for being a God who takes care of us. And that's the proper response. That's Paul's response. He can't help but burst out in praise here because God has provided for his needs and, and he's going to provide for the Philippians' needs as well. And everything should be turned back to praise. I mean, that's the idea. And so Paul says, praise be to God. Be glory forever and ever. And so the same thing is true of us today. If we're believers in Jesus Christ, we have everything. Thing that we need spiritually. And, and if we're living faithfully uh, for God, we can give faithfully to his purposes. And, and, and God has promised that God will supply for our needs. And so if that's the case, let us praise God. Let's glorify God for his continued love and his faithfulness to us. And so we can come up with a lot of reasons why we can't give and why we shouldn't give. Well, this text takes them all away. That God provides for us. As we faithfully live for him, as we faithfully give uh, to his work, what would hold us back? What would keep us back from giving? Uh, if our cheerful giving is pleasing to God, why would we not want to please him? Why would we not give? If our giving is actually profitable for us, if it produces eternal benefits, why would we not give? If it makes an impact for eternity, why wouldn't we give? God has given us every reason to give because he graciously and generously has given to us and continues to give. So God wants us to live faithfully, and he wants us to give faithfully. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving to us. We thank you for giving us salvation in Jesus Christ, first and foremost. Uh, we thank you for uh, his willingness to be made poor so that we might be made rich. And truly, we are rich in Jesus Christ. We have been given everything and more uh, because of that. And Father, not only do you, not only do you provide for our spiritual needs, you provide for our physical needs. Well, as long as we are, uh, are living faithfully uh, and giving faithfully. And Father, help us. Help us to see uh, what you want us to see in this passage this morning. Help us to live for you and give to you. Uh, Father, it's easier uh, said than done, and we need your spirit to, uh, to use us and to help us see these truths and help us to trust in you and, and to lean on you. Uh, we pray, Father, that as we go our separate ways today, uh, that you might keep us safe, uh, that you might use us where you have us, and, and Father, that you might bring us safely back uh, this evening to, uh, to praise you. Uh